Welcome everyone to today's webinar sponsored by Modernizing Medicine. We will begin with a presentation and have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We look forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. All opinions expressed in the discussion today are the presenter's own and not those of their organization or modernizing medicine. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to our moderator, Scott Becker, to begin today's presentation and introduce our presenters. Thank you so much. We're going to talk for about 40 to 45 minutes on the core questions of the webinar, really discussing key trends in endoscopy and gastroenterology. We've got three great presenters and also a great sponsor in modernizing medicine. I'm going to take a moment to have our presenters introduce themselves, uh, and then we'll get started with the discussion. At the end of the discussion, we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, Dr. Shake, let me start with asking you to introduce yourself, then Dr. Rivadanera, then Barry Tanner, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Levy just to say a few words and say hello. Uh, Dr. Shaikh? Sure, Scott. Thanks. So I want to first uh, start off by thanking you for having us share this platform with you today. I'm a big fan of your publications and find them very helpful in navigating our rapidly changing healthcare field. Um, so I'm a gastroenterologist in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I'm approximately three years now out from advanced endoscopy training and about four years out from my general GI fellowship. Um, over the last few years, I've predominantly been affiliated with one uh, gastroenterology endoscopy center and two multi-specialty ASCs, as well as multiple acute inpatient hospital settings. Most of my interests are endoscopy-related, both in terms of general and advanced endoscopy, especially as it relates to quality issues and cost savings seen with moving GI procedures from HOPD to ASC settings but also in working with ASCs to help them build sustainable GI endoscopy services. Thank you very much. And, and David, Dr. Riva De Niro? Uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, again, I echo the same uh, sentiments of uh, thank you to you, Scott, and uh, Becker's family, and also Modernized Medicine to coordinate this uh, wonderful effort here today. I, I'm a colon rectal surgeon, uh, David Riva De Niro. I'm part of the uh, large health system uh, here in the New York area, Northwell Health. I'm uh, by training a colorectal surgeon. I deal mostly with the lower GI aspects of things, uh, mostly colon cancer, rectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And uh, in addition to a, a very busy clinical practice that involves uh, endoscopy, colonoscopy, uh, the vast majority of our work is, uh, you know, uh, taking care of the surgical issues uh, in terms of gastroenterology. I've um, been in practice for uh, almost 20 years, and, uh, and again, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to participate today. Thank you so David. much, David. Um, Barry? So I will add my thanks to Scott. I've known Scott for more than 20 years and worked with Becker's Healthcare, and I'm really pleased to be included in this. Um, to start off, uh, Barry Tanner, I'm not a physician. Um, I do function for the past 20 years as the Chief Executive Officer of Physicians Endoscopy. Uh, we always refer to it internally as PE, although in these, these days with private equity investment, it does get a little confusing. But PE is the largest single specialty provi uh, <clears throat> services provider to the ambulatory surgery uh, industry where, that is GI focused. That is, we we have approximately 65 ambulatory surgery centers that we provide services to, and essentially all they do is gastroenterology. Um, I will say that later, as gastroenterology is changing, which is the focus really of this this webinar, uh, PE is also changing, uh, and later this month we will become a fully sort of uh, full spectrum provider, if you will, of services to gastroenterologists uh, with deep experience in uh, both the uh, practice management area, ambulatory surgery centers, uh, focused on GI, and all of the ancillary services. And, and we'll, we'll reach that point through a partnership with a 
a large and extremely well well respected uh, GI uh, platform uh, that we expect to close on just in just about two two weeks. Well, well congratulations on all three of your both practices and growth. Dr. Levy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and in a quick introduction too? Yes. So first of all, thank you to everybody who's uh, joined in this uh, webinar um, and to our speakers and to Beckers. Um, I'm representing Modernizing Medicine, um, which is the largest GI-specific um, platform in the country at the present time. I presently serve as an independent advisor um, to modernizing medicine, gastroenterology. I've been doing this in this role for the last year and a half. My background simply is that I was in private practice of gastroenterology for 40 years. I retired two years ago. A um, year and a half ago, I joined modernizing medicine to continue to help them with clinical and product development and so forth. Uh, my past history is that I was the co-founder and president and CEO of Capital Digestive Care, a 65-physician gastroenterology group in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area and served in that capacity for 10 years. <clears throat> and my <clears throat> excuse me, experience with the G-Gastro platform goes back 17 years. So thank you, everyone, for joining in. And, and, and thank you very much. So, Dr. Sheikh, let me start with you, and then I'll move to, to from Imran to David to Barry. Imran, tell us a little bit about the biggest challenge in GI today. Yeah, so great question, Scott. You know, I'm not sure that there's one kind of biggest challenge, I think, but certainly high up on the list concerning your average gastroenterologist is the continually declining, reimbur uh, continually declining reimbursements that gastroenterologists are facing. For the last few years, I think we've seen almost double-digit percentage decreases every year in GI reimbursements, and that's worrisome because, you know, 20, 30 years ago, a GI fellowship was two years, and now today it takes at least three and sometimes four years, depending on if the fellow is going to specialize in advanced endoscopy or transplant hepatology or other aspects of gastroenterology. So the cost of uh, medical training is increasing both in terms of uh, time involved with training and also the dollar cost. Your average med student is graduating med school today with uh, at least $200,000 in debt, um, but we're facing uh, continually uh, declining reimbursements. So, so, Imran, you've highlighted two issues, both declining reimbursement and the time and money and debt of sort of med school and training and so forth. David, let me ask you. Couple of your thoughts on the biggest challenges in sort of colorectal surgery, GI, et cetera. Well, I think uh, Scott uh, Imran uh, already pointed out some very salient points that I think we're all facing, not in just GI, but in all aspects of medicine, obviously. I think for GI, you know, look, we have a, we're seeing increasing numbers of patients with significant pathology. You know, we've seen a very worrisome increase in colon cancer, particularly in young patients, colon erectile cancer, uh, which is very worrisome. So uh, there are aspects of how can we get patients evaluated properly in a timely fashion. So there's the whole issue of uh, access. Uh, there's the continued strain about uh, shifting from, uh, you know, uh, fee-for-service to value-based uh, service and, and possibility of bundle payments and, and again, the, the strain you already heard from Dr. Sheikh that, you know, again, uh, private practice, which has been the, the mainstay of medicine and the mainstay in gastroenterology is uh, slowly eroding and, and physicians are becoming part of uh, large uh, health systems and, and there's a place for that uh, in modern medicine now uh, that didn't exist David, before. So there's several challenges. Look, look. Let me ask you this question. You've noted the increase in colon cancers, the increase in colorectal cancers. Talk about that just for a moment and sort of what you're seeing and, 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 and how concerning, and you mentioned different age levels and so forth. Just a moment on that. Yeah, so look, uh, we, we have made tremendous strides in screening people, you know, in terms of multiple screening uh, modalities that exist for screening for colon cancer. 
everybody's obviously familiar with colonoscopy, but there are several other modalities that are out there that provide good screening methods uh, to, to reduce the chance of colorectal cancer. And we've made some strides, particularly in those patients above the age of 50, those in their 60s and 70s. We've seen a decline in mortality due to colorectal cancer. What we have seen, which is very troubling, is a significant increase, a doubling or four-time fold in colon and rectal cancer in those patients younger than 50. So those who have traditionally not been uh, those patients that have been screened. And uh, so this year is the first year that uh, several societies, including the American Cancer Society, have advocated screening patients at the age of 45 as a screening modality. Of course, we're not talking any symptoms. We're talking basically on uh, age uh, screening. And, and this is a significant issue, you know, uh, again, in terms of manpower, in terms of resources, in terms of cost. And, and will this, will we David? see it eventually? Yeah. Let me just ask you this question, just in, yeah. and then I'll move on to Barry. What's the? Is there any sense of the cause of increased amounts of colon cancers and colorectal cancers? I don't know if anyone in particular has a cause, but no doubt that, that we've seen, obviously, as the population has increased in weight, the obesity challenge uh, that uh, you know uh, we're all facing. Uh, we believe that obesity, weight gain, metabolic phenomenon in states are, are probably one of the many causes related to this in addition to dietary intake, a uh, uh, high red meat diet, and a uh, low fiber diet. Fascinating, and thank you very much. Barry, it, 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 tell us a little bit about biggest challenges you see from your perspective. You've been in the endoscopy business, but you're very tightly tied to gastroenterologists hugely well respected in the business. What are some of the biggest challenges that you see? Yeah, it's interesting, Scott, as the, the non-physician in the group, I, I, my answer was, is roughly the same. Uh, I would cite the, not that this is the holy grail, but I would cite the sustainability of the independent practice of gastroenterology in most urban and suburban markets across the country as being extremely challenged going forward. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the things that have been mentioned. Certainly professional reimbursements, I think, are approaching the point of being too low to sustain growth, to invest in succession planning for practices, and to invest in technology and human capital that's necessary to sustain the practice. I also think that because of this, and it dovetails together, gastroenterologists have become too reliant on uh, ancillary revenue streams for survival. Uh, and quite honestly, the, the lack of professional resources and the, and the, lack of a, the lack of ability that results from that to invest in independent practice, I think is probably the biggest threat that, that people face. Thank you. And sort of a fascinating perspective from all three of you. Um, Imran noting decline reimbursement, increased cost um, of medical school and time and training. Um, David noting a number of things, but particularly noting sort of increases in colon cancer and colorectal cancer. And you talking about sort of the over-reliance on ancillaries to make sure that practice still works and that new practice can work. Barry, let me start with you, and then I'll go back around the turn here. Um, three years from now, how is GI practice different than it is today? Yeah, I, I think if I look, try to look in the, the crystal ball, I think three years from now we're going to see larger independent practices dominating the landscape in many markets. I'm not really talking about the rural markets, but other than the very rural markets, I think that will be the case. I also think you're going to see a more diversified spectrum of clinical offerings, uh, more gastroenterologists moving into general health management, uh, infusion, uh, weight management, uh, maybe even clinical research. Um, I also think you're going to see much, much more collaboration between gastroenterologists and hospitals, health systems, and payers, especially in these larger uh, more regionalized practices, 
And finally, I think I would say that I, I would predict there's going to be a significant shift over, uh, not, not that I say significant, a gradual shift toward more therapeutic procedures or gastroenterologists doing much more therapeutic and less on the diagnostic, uh, which has been kind of the bread and butter for so many years. Uh, and that's going to occur as alternate colorectal screening technologies begin to improve exponentially over the next three, five, ten years. And, and, and David, let me ask you a follow-up to some things Beery talked. Beery talked about big regional practices, big multi-specialty groups. He also talked about more collaboration. Then, then he also noted this concept of the movement from diagnostic to therapeutics. In the treating of colorectal cancer, if you could just give us a moment on sort of the evolutions of that. I know in certain cancers, there's suddenly, it seems like over the last few years, increased movement towards precision medicine, um, different types of syndromes, Lynch syndrome and so forth, being treated in different ways. How does that evolve? How do you see that evolving, the big changes in sort of treatment of colorectal cancer? And, and again, let me ask David, Imran, and Barry, each of you to limit answers to 30, 60 seconds just in the interest of time and conciseness. Yeah, Scott, it's a great question. So I think no, uh, no doubt as we move into future, you're going to see more precision type of medicine where uh, patients are going to be individually treated. Their tumors are going to be specifically uh, tested and marked to see what type of chemotherapy agents are they going to respond to or not? Instead of uh, just pulling everybody together to one therapy, you're going to have individualized, very boutique type of care, particularly for cancer. I think that's already happening, will continue to happen in the next several years. Again, minimally invasive surgery, minimally invasive approaches, uh, including more robotics, uh, particularly for colorectal cancer, I think you will see more of that. Thank you. And Imran, your thoughts, three years from now, how is practice or gastroenterology different than it is today? Yeah, sure. So to kind of latch on to a little bit of what David was talking about with the screening age and the American Cancer Society coming out last fall and recommending decreasing the screening age to 45, I think hopefully we'll start to see a lot more Americans in the 45 to 50 age range uh, starting to get screened for colon cancer. Unfortunately, uh, despite that guideline and despite prior GI Society guidelines to start screening the African-American community that has higher incidences of colon cancer um, at 45. Unfortunately, what we see on the ground is that third-party payers typically uh, don't cover screening colonoscopies for folks 45 to 49 years old. So hopefully over the next few years, we'll start seeing more third-party payers um, picking those up and more patients being screened and more colon cancer cases being um, prevented. Um, I think other changes that we may see, hopefully we'll see more cases move from um, HOPD settings to ASC or endoscopy center settings and um, probably see more joint ventures with healthcare systems and physician groups, both with third parties like Physicians Endoscopy, USPI, SCA, and others, um, but also just maybe more uh, straight joint ventures between healthcare systems and physician groups. Let me ask you a follow-up question to, to something you, that we're talking about. Day-to-day -day practice and how you practice, the, obviously you talked about, look, people really need to be screened earlier, but payers won't pay for it. But besides that, how does your day-to-day -day practice change? Does it move more from screening to other types of things, or does it really stay more screening colonoscopies and endoscopy and so forth, and the guys like, Dave, like David do more of the therapeutic treatment. How does the practice of GI change over the next couple of years? So, I mean, and again, to, to latch on to what Barry was saying, I mean, I think we're doing more and more therapeutic procedures. There's a, that was part of the reason that I wanted to pursue a fourth-year advanced endoscopy uh, training program. We're definitely doing more and more therapeutic procedures. Uh, David, of course, is doing a lot of those on the surgical side. I'm doing a lot of those on the endoscopic side. So, uh, for example, we're seeing a lot more large, complex colon polyps that can be removed um, endoscopically without the need for surgery. Uh, so we're doing a lot more endoscopic mucosal resections and taking out these uh, these polyps in uh, long, detailed um, uh, colonoscopy procedures, and some of them that can't be treated or that recur after endoscopic resection are being referred um, for surgeries as they should be. 
Thank you. And, and, and let me, again, start here with you and then come back to David and Barry. You and David have ultimately ended up more or less with related to large health systems versus in total independent practice. What's the makeup of what you see of people moving from independent practice to either large health systems? What's some of your quick perspectives on what do you see out there in terms of people's practice and practice choices? Yeah, so interesting question. I mean, so where I am right now in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, North Texas, I mean, this is a um, a, a very independent uh, physician uh, area, and we're very proud of that independence. Um, I think nationwide you're seeing about 40 to, well, I'd say probably about 50-50 split. 50% 50 of gastroenterologists are uh, employed or have some kind of employment agreement with a large healthcare system, and about 50% um, are still fully independent. Uh, we're not seeing a massive shift in this area um, from independent to employed settings. Um, and of course, this area is well known to have, uh, I think, the largest GI group in the country. Um, uh, TDDC, uh, of course, is based out of South Lake, Texas. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're still seeing a lot of in independent minded um, gastroenterology practices uh, existing and thriving in, in this area. So still a great split out there. I mean, in, in, in still lots of very successful independent groups and so forth, and then 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 lots working in great settings, uh, as as you are advanced endoscopy working with systems. David, the same question from the colorectal perspective. I mean, colorectal surgeons probably traditionally have had a higher percentage that are affiliated with health systems than than, than straight gastroenterologists. What's the trend there versus employment versus independent practice? So uh, I think, uh, you know, we've seen a very a very similar shift uh, where the vast majority of co uh, colorectal surgeons were independent uh, private practice. Well, we've seen that shifting over the last five, eight years or so of uh, being more employed by health systems or having a, a very collegial, very collaborative relationship uh, with the health systems in many ways. Uh, if not straight employment, uh, there is uh, some sort of uh, uh, collaboration that is happening. Um, uh, again, in this area of New York and Long Island, we still see a significant amount of private practice, very well run, uh, doing very well, both gastroenterologists and colorectal surgeons. Thank you. And David or Dr. Sheikh, let me just ask you this question. It's a follow-up to something that David said earlier. It's an audience question. Are you seeing an increase in diagnosis and treatment of IBD-related disorders, Crohn's, colitis, et cetera, with younger patients? I'll say just kind of generally speaking from my practice, I don't necessarily think I'm seeing an increase um, in, in IBD. I mean, I, I do have a significant IBD patient population, but I'm not, I haven't specifically noticed uh, an increase. And part of that may be, um, you know, my practice, again, is more, more southern. Um, IBD has a bit of a northern uh, prevalence. So David is, I think, in upstate New York, and so he may have a different take on that. So, uh, any quick thoughts on we're, that? we're in the Long Island, uh, New York area, and we do see a significant amount of inflammatory bowel disease, both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, um, often because, uh, again, of the patient population in this area uh, suffers from a significant amount of that. But we've also seen an increase in, I think, celiac or gluten-free diagnosis, and I think just people are more in tune uh, at this moment in time to, to, to work that up appropriately. Thank you. And, and, and Barry, let me ask you the question about independent gastroenterologists. You've got sort of a national view of this uh, because your, your core partner base are independent gastroenterologists and hospital systems with, with, with employed gastroenterologists of both. Any thoughts on what you see out there versus what David and Imran see? Any thoughts? I think the, the biggest things that I see, Scott, are that you, know, you look at the primary uh, referral sources to gastroenterologists around the country, and it tends to be primary care physicians sort of predominantly. And as we look at the changing landscape, you, you now see, you know, I'll call it roughly 60, 65 percent even of primary care physicians being largely employed by health systems or in the case of, you know, United Optum uh, by a large um, payer. 
And I think that that point has instilled a certain level of fear in independent gastroenterologists in terms of, you know, once you control the referral sources, what's next? And, and I think that coupled with the changing demographic of gastroenterologists, though the average age of a practicing gastroenterology, gastroenterologist today is in the mid to upper 50s. I think the last, the last statistic I saw was 57 or 57 or 58, something like that. And so, you know, as, as if that's the average, I think you look around and look at how the, the dynamics are changing and you say, hmm, how long am I going to be able to sustain independent practice? So I think that's, that's my take on what's going on. Thank you. So big overall threats to independent practice, but a lot of a lot of strong practices still out there and about as Imran said fifty fifty or so. Uh Fury, another couple follow up questions. First question is, do you see more and more gastroenterology groups, GI groups with their own path labs? What's the what's the take on what's happened there? You know, I think it's been a trend scott for a long time, but I, I will say that uh, as I look, you know, sort of three years out, I, I think the, the larger sort of regional gastroenterology players, someone mentioned TDDC or the GI Alliance, as they're now called, um, I see those types of pathology labs as very sustainable in an ongoing way. Now, all have to be able to demonstrate high quality, but I think the, the you know, sort of the smallest practices, the the practices of maybe four, five, six, seven physicians that have small in-house pathology lab, I think those are going to be increasingly challenged by the, the large payers uh, and by the, their relationships or contracts with the, the lab cores and quests of the world uh, just on a pure pricing basis. And, and Imran, let me ask you this question. Thank you, Barry. So there's been great growth for a long time in the PATH labs. But, but still significant challenges for small practices doing it in terms of payer rules and payers being willing to pay for it and so forth. A different issue that's a clinical issue and a payer issue. Um, Dr. Sheikh, the issue of propofol versus opioid-based drugs for sedation, any thoughts on the evolution now as people get very more and more sensitive about not wanting to use opioids? Any thoughts on that and, and contrasting that with reimbursement issues on it? Any any quick thoughts on that issue? Well, I think, uh, you know, we, we've got to kind of individualize care for kind of each patient. It's hard to have kind of a, a blanket policy to cover all your patients. So I think, you know, e each patient's care needs to be individualized. There certainly is a role for conscious sedation um, for the appropriately selected patient. That being said, most patients now are familiar with propofol-based deep anesthesia and, uh, to be quite honest, are, are requesting it um, at the outset. Um, I think that most GI practices, at least in large urban settings, are predominantly using propofol-based sedation, um, and it tends to work very well. It's very safe. Uh, it's easy. On, it, it's quick onset, quick offset, um, and patients are very comfortable during the procedures. Thank you very, very much. David, there's another question about increase in incidence of colon cancer and colorectal cancer. And, and I'm not sure, you'll, you'll have to let us know whether you can answer this. Are you seeing greater amounts of colorectal cancer amongst foreign patients versus U.S. born patients, amongst different populations? Any quick thoughts or insights there as to whether more prevalence in certain populations or others? Yeah, so uh, we do know that there's a good correlation with diet, you know, with colon cancer, uh, and that's been studied uh, for a long period of time. Uh, diets that are high in fat, low in fiber, are more colon cancer or rectal cancer prone for sure. So if you have patients who come to the United States and start eating a, a very high fat uh, diet, uh, low in fiber, you'll see uh, over a short period of time uh, that that uh, that group of people who uh, originally did not have that higher incidence in, in their native country, they start developing classic uh, diet-related colon cancer uh, pathology. Thank you very much, and 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 fascinating and challenging. Um, the um, let me ask you, 
a combined question for David first and then Imran and Beery. Sort of the biggest threat to independent practice of surgeons, any thoughts on that? Is it declining reimbursement? Is it just controlled by health systems and, and big payers? Any thoughts on the biggest threats to independent practice? I think it's a it's a combination of uh, things. It's a declining uh, declining reimbursements. Obviously, it's uh, increasing cost of running your private practice. It's uh, it's uh, increased regulations, uh, both uh, in terms of EMR and and other regulations. Uh, um, it is the fact that uh, health systems again uh, uh, will uh, will often. Uh, uh, higher uh, your, your, your referrals and, 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 and then that uh, there's a shifting of the referral base. Uh, so it's a little combination of, uh, of all these things. And Dr. Sheikh, any thoughts on the same question? Big threats to independent practice. Yeah, no, similar, um, similar thought process to David. I think, you know, for the small groups, uh, you know, definitely would be more concerned about consolidation within larger healthcare systems and, you know, CMS reporting requirements in terms of MIPS and macro. I mean, the smaller groups, the small mom and pop shop types of GI practices, they just don't have the economies of scale to be able to absorb the costs of meeting these reporting needs. Um, they don't have the economies of scale to benefit from ancillary services that can help them stay independent, like, you know, endoscopy centers, path labs, et cetera. And, in, 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 in Barry, some of your thoughts as you see GI practices struggle with making sure that their answers are great, that they have the scale they need, some of your thoughts on this and how do gastroenterology practices, colorectal practices for that matter, manage to stay independent over the next decade if they choose to? Yeah, I, I think there, some of this is financially driven and some of it maybe I'll call I think is generational. Uh, one of the reasons I am a, certainly a champion of consolidation within the independent GI practices is because it, it does take several steps towards solving some of the affordability questions. Um, such as, you know, how do we afford to attract new providers, uh, and particularly providers who have a different, you know, set of demands in terms of work-life balance versus perhaps historical independent practitioner characteristics that we've seen for the past 10 or 20 years. Uh, I think also the, the extreme cost of investing in the technologies and human resources that are going to be necessary for independent practices, you know, to remain competitive and even to anticipate what value-based care really means and how they're going to deal with that sort of changing uh, reimbursement in the delivery of GI care. Uh, I think all of those things I mean human capital, expertise, affordability, changing demands of practitioners themselves, I and mean, I think those are all going to lead uh, toward uh, either questioning survival or how do we consolidate so that we can spread these costs of investments that need to be made over a much larger headcount. So, so harder and harder to have small scale and deal with all these different costs and regulations, EMR, challenges, just across the board, and also deal with big payers and big systems is, is fascinating. Um, let me ask David and Dr. Sheikh this question, Dr. Ruben Danera and, and Dr. Sheikh. Somebody asked the question of, look, it's become, becoming clearer and clearer that earlier colorectal screening and endoscopy screening colonoscopies, excuse me, are necessary, uh, but the cost of it is not insignificant for payers and Medicare, so payers aren't interested in paying for it. How do you see that squaring out over time? David, any quick thoughts on whether this is a, a, a war that will have a victory in it, or is this just going to be a, a long-term problem where doctors need to come up with big reasons for medical necessity to get earlier screenings done. Any any thoughts on how this evolves, David or Dr. Sheikh? 
Yeah, I, this is David here. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, I think in time uh, we'll see this get uh, uh, approved by the, by the major carriers. You know, I, I think there will be a, a significant push by, by patients um, uh, that the age and the screening age does have to come down. And the question is to what age? Because, again, we're finding patients much earlier than 45. So when do you start screening? Now, again, everything doesn't have to be a colonoscopy. We have other methods to screen patients. So there's, you know, fit testing, and now there's DNA stool testing. So there are other modalities. But I, I do think eventually uh, the insurance uh, uh, co uh, companies will, will, will acquiesce to this. But, yes, Dr. Shrek, you know, do you want to add anything? Yeah, no, thanks. I think, you know, Please go ahead. the bottom line is preventive health care always pays off, right? We've got to move away from the kind of reactive health care that we've kind of had in this country for a while, and we've got to focus on preventative health care because it always pays off. I mean, bottom line, it's cheaper to pay for a screening colonoscopy or another screening modality for colon cancer for a patient in their, say, late 40s than it is to pay for them to have surgeries and chemotherapy and or radiation therapy once they're diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Thank you. Got it. And and, and an uphill battle because in, in getting insurers to actually pay for anything that adds to their overall cost is just a great challenge, or at least a short-term cost. So thank you. Beery, You've got sort of this bird's eye view of private equity investment in the whole healthcare space, in GI, in, in everything. A, a couple quick thoughts on what PE investment looks like in gastroenterology. I know that increasingly some of the huge gastro practice management companies have taken in PE investments. What does that do to practices? What's the, you know, what's the there there on that? Well, first of all, I'm, I think I'm, I'm very positive for the most part, Scott, on private equity's role, uh, potential role, at least in healthcare and specifically in gastroenterology. Uh, but like anything else, uh, it doesn't come risk-free. Um, first of all, I, I think I said this earlier, but I think consolidation of practices will really help to, pr to promote the uh, ongoing independent practice of gastroenterology. I also think that through consolidation, you know, and the capital that, that often fuels it, um, it creates, it really helps to create a structure, you know, to sustain the practice with a variety of different employment options and opportunities for people coming into the specialty as opposed to just, you know, sort of the historical entrepreneurial way. The larger the practice, I think it can function from an employment standpoint, much more like a large health system. Uh, you know, there's a lot of women in gastroenterology now who might want to work part-time as they raise families. I think all of that can be better accommodated under a larger practice, and private equity does help to fuel that. Uh, along with that comes the ability to, for more technology investment and certainly more professional expertise. You know, I think you can create a, a, a GI practice that now is highly professional, very metrics driven, uh, uh, and that's hard to do today with a small practice. The risks, of course, are, you know, there's a heavy focus on dollars. Private equity's job is to uh, buy things, grow them, and sell them, and you need to go into it with that clearly in mind. Uh, I think the other thing that I see is I fear that for the sake of the transaction, physicians will try to sell or surrender, give up, if you will, too much of their current income, uh, which will really, I think, hurt the sustainability of the practice, especially if there's a long road to recovery. So, and then they need to worry about what the exit looks like. So, I mean, it's a balanced approach, and I'm generally much more in favor than against, but I think you have to go into it with the, you know, a clear understanding of where the risk reward is. Thank you. So lots of pros and cons, but one of the types of way to fuel a group getting bigger and being able to fight off a lot of these different trends or, or be able to take advantage of some of the scale needs they have to have 
uh, but also some real caveats to it, sounds like. Imran, let me ask you the question. You ended up coming out of an advanced fellowship, advanced residency, um, and chose one route. Do you have any thoughts on the private equity route? Does that does that come onto your radar or, or David in any of your thinking currently? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I think we're still quite early stage for private equity and gastroenterology. I think the next few years is going to be crucial to see the results of some of uh, the groups that have partnered with private equity firms over the last, uh, you know, weeks, months, and years. Uh, I think, you know, for larger independent groups that want to remain independent from hospital systems, I think private equity offers an alternative option that's certainly worth considering. Um, on the other hand, you know, when I speak to fellows who are graduating looking for jobs, you know, and they're looking to start a, a new career, 25, 30-year career, they're unsure and uncertain what the long-term consequences will be to them, again, just because we haven't seen any long-term follow-up from, from the GI groups that are private equity backed right now. So I think the next few years will be kind of crucial in, in, um, in seeing how things play out. And your point is well taken because if, once you end up with a private equity group, you typically have, and that was saying different state laws and challenges, you're, you're somewhat tied up early on in your career for a long time w without necessarily clarity about whether you really want that for the long run. So I think a great, great point. David, any, any thoughts from you on this issue? No, I, we haven't really seen that happen in, in our area. You know, we're well aware of uh, private equity and, and other specialties like anesthesia and dermatology and ophthalmology, but it hasn't really hit the, the GI or the colorectal uh, scene as of yet. Thank you. And Barry, we've got one more question from the audience around, around this line. The typical hold period for a fund in a business or a practice What's the typical period of time that a private equity fund is an investor, and it's typically not directly in the practice, it's in a company that invests in the practice. How often does that private equity fund typically turn over? It's, it's, first of all, it's very opportunistic, but most private equity funds, you know, on average have a, about a seven-year life to them. Not that they're prohibited, for the most part, for going longer, but Generally speaking, I would say look at an average life of a fund of about seven years, and the private equity groups are generally using the first perhaps three to four years of that seven to invest in platforms, and then the final three to four years is the cycle where they're kind of harvesting the results of those investments. But that, that's kind of the life cycle of a private equity investment. Thank you. So typically, if you invest with a platform or private equity company, the platform may stay the same for 20 years, but the private equity backers to that platform might turn over one to seven years, and typically no longer than that, and sometimes opportunistically much earlier than the seven years, but something along those lines. Let me ask one more question. Just an example, that PE has been private equity owned for over 20 years. And so we are currently, with our fifth private equity partner, the, the PE platform, if you will, has remained very stable. Uh, it, we, it's remained stable and growing for 20 years. I think the same will happen for the next 20 years. So for us, I would say PE has been very helpful to us. The private equity groups have been very helpful to us uh, in providing all sorts of benefits. But at the same time, the driver, the consistency of our vision and what we're trying to accomplish has remained the same. Thank you. So if you're a practice that does a transaction with a platform company, even though the PE fund behind that practice platform may, may change, it may or may not have an impact on the practice. What you do know as a practice is that once you sell, whether you sold to AmSurge as a company, which is a surgery center company, or you sell your practice to one of the roll-ups in practice management, you could end up sort of, uh, you, you might not have a lot of alternatives for some serious period of time. Um, let, let me do this. Let me sort of circle back to Dr. Sheikh and David and Dr. Riven-Denera. Uh, Imran, colonoscopy and alternatives. 
30, 60 seconds on what you see out there in terms of colonoscopy alternatives and, and you know, 20 years ago, virtual colonoscopy was going to change everything, but it's not. What do you see right now? Right. Yeah, you know, I mean, as physicians, we're always for emerging technologies that can positively affect patient care and get them screened for colon cancer. Um, I mean, a colonoscopy is the goal gold standard for colon cancer screening and prevention and, and probably always will be. There's no other technology, um, at least at this stage, that can diagnose and resect precancerous polyps at the same time. Um, with, with some of these newer stool tests, I mean, we're seeing more low-risk patients being screened um, using stool tests and, and thus we're seeing more referrals for diagnostic colonoscopies after, say, positive uh, cologuards or positive FIT tests. Um, including more referrals for advanced endoscopies to be performed for complex polyp resection um, or referral for surgery if that's what's indicated. Let me ask this question of David and David, you'll, you'll tell me if you could answer this question and then I'll come back to Dr. Sheikh if not. Um, Dr. Rivet Snera, sorry. Um, David, the, the genetic screening, genetic, genetic screening of cancers, any thoughts on this so far? I, 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 I'm familiar personally because our family's Lynch syndrome people, but tell us a little so, bit about genetic cancer screenings. So genetic cancer screenings, no doubt, is playing a more uh, significant role in, in diagnosing patients. Uh, again, uh, this is akin to, to, to women that suffer from the BRCA gene where they have an increased risk of breast cancer. The same thing happens with colon cancer. These families have clusters of colon cancer, uterine cancer, stomach cancers, and you can get tested. And now over-the-counter testing or, you know, that's very commercially available is opening up, a, a, you know, a lot of new diagnosis of family members with uh, Lynch or hereditary non polyposis colon cancer syndrome. So I think you'll see that increasing over the next several years. Thank you. Let me do this. We've had just um, magnificent panel discussion from Imran, David, and Barry, and just as good an audience. I, I, I must have been able to, within the discussion, bring into play 10 to 15 questions from the audience. So fantastic group. Dr. Levy, can you offer a few remarks on what you see out there We'd love to get a few minutes or a few moments of your perspective as well. Okay, thank you on that, Scott. Um, I think what everybody has heard is a whole bunch of different things that are affecting the GI world, and lots of these are significant challenges, and many times physicians, whether you're hospital employed or whether you've been in practice or whether you're private practice or whether you're just starting out, um, candidly, it's a little bit scary out there because things keep shifting and keep changing. I, I want to make a few comments. Number one, and people have heard this before, but this is really important to say, medicine, just like politics, is local. And what affects one community does not necessarily affect another. Large cities um, <clears throat> may or may not be the right place for consolidations. Small communities do not seem to be. In some areas, hospitals control everything, and the physicians have little power and little say. In other areas, groups banding together can indeed have power, uh, whether it's dealing with the hospital, uh, hopefully in a collaborative way, or dealing with the payers. So all of these things require a lot of challenge. And one of the things that modernizing medicine has done is to get input all along its way. Um, and I've had the opportunity since uh, 1992 to have input to their product development and everything they've done. Um, and at the present time, we have an advisory board. So it's very much, you know, GI focused. But my key here is whether you're in the hospital with an endo unit, whether you're in private practice, small practice, big practice, you have to, to survive. You have to have an IT partner, not a vendor, an IT partner. And specifically and ideally, that should be one in the field of gastroenterology that is focused and is GI specific. They can provide all of these services because we should all be about patient care first, 
but we all have to survive economically. So we've got to be able to provide all of the services and ideally on one platform. Um, the other important thing is the services that are provided by your IT partner should be not just for the providers, but also for your support staff. Because if they can't do their job right because they're with an antiquated system or one that is not user friendly, then you're frozen in water, whether you're in the hospital or whether you're in private practice. So you need a system that can do the electronic medical record, the end of report writer, that can handle the, the practice management, business things, the revenue cycle management, the analytics, and you've got to be able to handle all the MIPS requirements. You have to have patient engagement tools. Ideally, you should have mobility features. You have to be able to integrate with hospital EMR systems. Cloud services make things a lot easier. And it's always better to have a group as an IT partner that has experience with both small practices and large groups. Um, that's what modernizing medicine does. Um, but I think whatever vendor that anybody chooses, please don't just choose a vendor. Choose someone that you can partner with because if you have a partner, then you can grow together. And if that's not the situation, then you're going to have problems from a business and a clinical standpoint as you move ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Levy. I, um, your, your comment about whether it's Modernizing Medicine, which is a great company, or another company that really acts like a partner to you versus a vendor to you is a, is a very different thing and a very different perspective and, and a very important one. So thank you. I love your comments and appreciate it and appreciate what you're doing. I, I want to thank again um, both yourselves, Modernizing Medicine, for sponsoring this, uh, and then just as much or more so our panelists who give their time freely for this, Dr. Sheikh, uh, Dr. Riva de Janeiro, David, I apologize. You might have to correct the, my pronunciation, which is awful. Scott, you've done a great and, job. And, great job. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. And, and Barry Tanner. But just a, a, a total pleasure visiting with the three of you. And our audience was magnificent. For, for, for me, I, I take the most pleasure in these when I learn something. And this was a, a, a webinar where I had a chance to learn a ton and generally – if, if we do, then our audience does. And so just great, great panelist, and thank you. Um, and, and that's all we've got today. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, folks.